whether you are with us here in the sanctuary overflow room joining us by live stream we are so glad that you are here welcome special word of welcome if you're visiting with us this morning we hope that you feel particularly welcome and at home and you'll come back and see us again very soon let me invite those of you sitting close to the fellowship pad if you want to pick that up and fill it out and pass it along if you are visiting and you leave us an email or a snail mail address then we will be in touch by email or snail mail just thanking you for being with us and giving you a little more information about how we understand what it means to be followers of Jesus Christ here at Central Longmont. Uh, while that's happening, a couple of announcements. First of all, uh, the normal one of reminding you <clears throat> that if you've got a prayer request you'd like included in the prayers of the people later in the service, these will be picked up during the first hymn, okay? So as you're standing up, if indeed you're gonna stand up to sing and you see folks going up and down, waving this it's because that's your opportunity to get the prayer request turned in secondly uh next sunday normally you will know those of you who have made your church home here for a while that every christmas about around about next sunday or so um, we have musical celebration which is a service that traditionally has been given over to the choir singing well the choir is obviously not singing at the moment we're still going to be having worship and it's still going to be a musical service but much of the singing we're going to be doing together, which is not a bad thing, right? So if you've been waiting for the opportunity to sing Advent and Christmas hymns, this is not a hymn sing, so you're not going to get to yell out hymn numbers, okay? But if you've been waiting to be able to sing Advent or Christmas hymns, next Sunday is your opportunity. So we invite you to be sure and be here with us for that. Next today is the target date for receiving pledge cards. Thanks to those of you who have turned them in. We have received a number of them and we are very grateful. If you have not, it doesn't mean this is your last chance. So that if you show up tomorrow and want to give us a pledge card, we're going to tell you, sorry, you missed the opportunity. We will continue to receive them at your convenience, but the quicker you can get them to us, the better, because clearly the decision has got some decisions to make about the operating budget for next year. And the session is meeting this month on the 16th, a little earlier in the month thanks to Christmas than we normally meet. So we would appreciate you getting the pledge cards into us as quickly as you can. Last thing I want to say something about is that you were sent an email this week um, about an opportunity that we were given as a congregation to help to co-sponsor an Afghani family. Um, which has made their way here. They were among that mass exodus of people you saw from the Kabul airport um, on TV. And if you read the email, you know that one of the unfortunate things that happened at that time is that the father and one of the children was separated from the remainder of the family at the airport and did not make it to this country. And the family does not know for sure where the father and the son are. Nonetheless, they are here, and we have the opportunity with our sister congregation, St. Andrew in Boulder, uh, to work to help them acclimate and get on their feet. Um, this involves a lot of opportunities for us as a family of faith. I'm not going to take the time this morning to articulate those because they were written out in that email. So you can go back and see it. If you don't do email and you didn't get it, please let us know in the church office. We can send you a hard copy of what's there. Main thing I want you to know this morning, really is two things. One, um, a number of you have asked if, if you can support the family financially. Interestingly enough, this is not about money. Because Lutheran Family Services, which is the organization, sort of the overarching organization responsible for resettling these families, is very clear that we want folks to be on their feet and self-sufficient as soon as possible, as opposed to inadvertently creating any kind of a relationship of dependency, right, where they're counting on other people for money. So right now, we do not need any funds. It's possible that at some point in the future we might. The main thing that we need is, frankly, sweat equity. But there's things that you can do that will require a lot of effort, things you can do that require not much effort at all. So in other words, there's something for almost everybody if you are inclined to do this. 
Um, Ruling Elder Phil Gurner is going to be our co-leader. There's going to be a co-leader from St. Andrew. Our co-leader is Phil Gurner. So if you have any questions or if you want to volunteer in any way, if you will contact Phil, you can contact me. You can also contact our Director of Mission and Outreach, Jennifer Hart Sars. Um, and let us know, and we will plug you in. And are you waving at me because you want me to say something? No, no you were just waving to say hi? Okay, okay. <laughs> so, all of that said, it is wonderful to have all of you with us this morning. It's good to be back with you. I had two productive weeks away, but it's good to be back with you. So, welcome. Oh, you do? Oh, that's right, you do. Of course you do. That's why you were waving at me. <laughs> Good morning. I'm Jennifer and I'm the Director of Mission and Outreach. Um, as most of you know, because we had to kick you out of there this morning, the Alternative Christmas Market starts today. Um, so take a um, wander over next door once we finish our service this morning. There's some beautiful items from lots of different wonderful vendors for you to take a look at. And also please stop, there are two craft tables set up for us to make Christmas cards for guests of Casa de Paz. Casa de Paz is one of our mission partners, and they welcome folks that are released from the ICE Detention Center in Aurora on a daily basis, um, house them, help them, contact their family or friends in this country, and get a bus ticket, plane ticket, and move on to their next destination. And they are seeing record numbers of, immig of immigrants being released, sometimes between 50 to 90 a day. Um, right now and one of the things that they do is provide them all with a backpack and in that backpack is a special um, message or a card from people like you um, that take the time to make them for them and so we would like to have you stop by um, the craft table and create your own Christmas card we've got about I don't know 10 to 13 different languages translated for you so you can make a message um, in a language of your choice from folks that they are seeing released from Spanish to French to Punjabi to Farsi to Chinese, Mandarin, um, Cantonese. There's lots of different options for you. Um, but make a beautiful card and help these people feel welcome and loved during this season of Advent and um, leave the cards here with me and I will get them off to Cassidy Paws this week. Thank you so much.
This morning, I'd like to thank Hannah Aparo. She's here as our guest musician. Shirley and Greg and I went to St. Olaf to see Madeline's Christmas Festival concert. And in the event of a blizzard, which is happening neither here nor in Minnesota, they're just about like we are here, we wanted to have a backup plan. So Hannah, we're so excited to have you play for us this morning and welcome. And now I'd like to invite Jeannie and Tom Moore and grandsons. Do we need a mic? Yeah, you do need a mic. It's right here. Oh, it's right here somewhere. Is this working? Would you please join us in the responsive litany that you'll see on the screens? In this season of Advent, we pray for God's peace. Christ is our light and the source of our peace. We witness the hostility between nations and neighbors. Christ is our light and the source of our peace. We see a world full of fractured relationships and unforgiving hearts. Christ is our light and the source of our peace. We seek relief from our own inner turmoil and restlessness. Christ is our light and the source of our peace. This morning we light two candles, the candle of hope and the candle of peace. This candle reminds us that Christ came into our world to restore peace and that only through our trust in God's word and his promises can we find our own inner peace. We remember that Jesus Christ is the Prince of Peace who taught us that through simple acts of love and forgiveness, peace is spread throughout the world. Please join me in our song response. You'll find the words here. Please pray with me. Gracious God, as we continue our Advent journey, we, pray we thank you for sending Jesus, the Prince of Peace, into a world filled with unrest and strife. We ask that you, by your Spirit, you quiet our restless hearts and instill in each of us the confidence and assurance that you are in control, ultimate control, and we need not fear. Give us the tools we need to serve you as faithful servant sons and daughters, making us willing instruments of your peace. Amen. Good morning. Peace of Christ be with you. Please stand if you're comfortable, and in doing so, let's join our voices in our welcome. The words will be on the screen. We gather this day, bringing with us our hopes and dreams, doubts and fears. Whether you're a visitor, guest, or friend, you are welcome here. If you're fighting disease or recovering from injury, suffering from pain or struggling mentally or emotionally, whatever your shame, your sorrows, your fears, your addictions, you are welcome here. Whether you're able to give generously of what you have, or what you have is barely enough to keep yourself going each day, you are welcome here. Whether you follow Jesus or don't know Jesus, whether your views are conservative, progressive, or indifferent, you are welcome here. Whoever you are, wherever you are in your faith journey, we'll come alongside you to worship, to learn, and to join hands in working in the community. You are, you welcome, are welcome here. In, in Christ's Christ name, name, all are welcome here. Amen. Please join me in prayer. Good morning, Father. This Advent season, we remember Mary and Joseph, 
giving thanks for their faithfulness, their courage and obedience in stepping out into the unknown with the strength of your spirit, playing their part in the fulfillment of your plan to bring your prodigal people home again. We pray that their example might be the pattern of our lives, that when your gentle whisper breaks through the clamor of the world and into our small corner, we pray that we might be ready to listen, and after having listened, to act. Amen. Please join me in our opening hymn, Prepare the Way, O Zion. The words are on the screen and in on page 106 in the hymnal. Join me in our prayer of confession. The words will be on the screen. As scripture tells us, if we think without sin, we are deceiving, deceiving ourselves. God invites us into God's presence to unburden ourselves of the sins we carry with us. Please join me as we confess our sins to God using the words on the screen. Lord Jesus, we confess our willingness to be loved but also our reluctantness to love. We confess our readiness to accept your forgiveness, but also our refusal to forgive. We confess our eagerness to grasp your offer of redemption, but also our resistance to follow you without question. In this, in this Advent time, forgive us our failure to who you should. Come to us anew, come to us anew, and by your grace, assist us to receive with joy as ever. And to as Simeon, with obedience as Mary, with love as you have loved us. Come, Lord Jesus. Now let's take a few moments to silently confess our personal sins to God. Hear the good news. Who is in a position to condemn? 
Only Christ, and Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. Christ reigns in power for us. Christ prays for us. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old life has gone. A new life has begun. Know that you are forgiven and be in peace. Amen. Please join me in prayer. Holy Father, you who are all-knowing and wise, teach us your ways. We seek your kingdom, your wisdom, and your insight as we want to have knowledge and understanding. We seek your wisdom so that we may walk in the path you lay before us, knowing right from wrong and protecting us against temptation and deceit, and sometimes even ourselves. Amen. Today's Old Testament reading is from Isaiah 11, 1 through 10, and the words will be on the screen. A shoot shall come out from the stump of Jesse, and a branch that shall grow out of his roots. The spirit of the Lord shall rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. His delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide by what his ears hear. But with the righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. Righteous righteousness shall be the belt around the waist and faith, faithfulness the belt around his loins. The wolf shall live with the lamb. The leopard shall lie down with the kid. The calf, the lion, and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze. Their young shall lie down together. And the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the asp. And the weaned child shall put his hand in the adder's den. They will not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. On that day, the root of Jesse shall stand as a sing signal to the peoples. The nations shall inquire of him, and his dwelling shall be glorious. This is the word of the Lord.
Our gospel reading this morning comes from the third chapter of Matthew, verses 1 through 12. I invite you to follow along as I read. The words will be on the screen. If you prefer to follow along using the Pew Bible in front of you, you'll find this on page 2 of the New Testament. And as always, if you have a translation you prefer to the NRSV that we use here in worship on an app, on a smartphone, or a tablet, we invite you to follow along that way. So Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. In those days, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness of Judea, proclaiming, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is the one of whom the prophet Isaiah spoke when he said, The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Now John wore clothing of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then the people of Jerusalem and all Judea were going out to him in all the region along the Jordan, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit worthy of repentance. Do not presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our ancestor, for I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now, the axe is lying at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, but one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and will gather his wheat into the granary, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. This is the word of the Lord. I want to thank Eddie Mendoza and John Watkin uh, both for preaching for me in my absence. As they well know, it is much easier to be away when you know that you've got trusted voices in the pulpit. So thanks to John, thanks to Eddie. John Cleese of Monty Python and Fame did a post-Python series called Faulty Towers where he played Basil Fawlty, proprietor of a small hotel on the southern coast of England. One of Basil's many annoying personality quirks was an assumed pretentiousness. In class-conscious Great Britain, Basil, who was himself decidedly middle class, was constantly looking for ways to attract, in his words, a better class of people to his hotel putting on all manner of pretentious airs in the process. In one episode, Basil decides to host what he called Gourmet Night, where chef-prepared haute cuisine would be served to the community's leading citizens. So Basil places an ad in the local paper publicizing Gourmet Night, which to the horror of Basil's wife, Sybil, said in bold letters, No riffraff. It was Groucho Marx who once said that he never wanted to belong to any organization that would have him as a member. (laughs) Marx was joking, of course, but nonetheless speaking the truth. Groups tend to restrict membership via particular requirements and expectations, right? And in doing so, essentially say what Basil said, no riffraff. Now, in Austin, where Terry and I live before moving here to Longmont, as you know, there's a Presbyterian church that has no requirements for membership, none. You don't have to be baptized. You don't have to make any public profession of faith. You don't even have to believe in God, let alone Jesus. Now, the Book of Order is clear. To be a member of any Presbyterian congregation, you have to be baptized or make a public profession of faith if you already are, and you most definitely have to believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. 
So clearly, at any number of levels, a requirement for membership that there are no requirements for membership is fairly outrageous. And yet, the people of that particular congregation would argue that requiring belief in Jesus in order to become a member of a church is rather like requiring a person to be well in order to be admitted to the hospital. Now, agree with the good people of that congregation or not, their lack of requirements for membership raises an intriguing question. If, as has often been pointed out, the church is a hospital for the soul, why do we expect a rather high degree of spiritual wellness prior to admission? Why invite people to the banquet with an advert which says, spiritually speaking, no riffraff? Well, this morning, as we continue our journey through Advent, the lectionary gives us, as the lectionary always does this time of year, a text about John the Baptist. Partly, this is because Advent is about expectation of and preparation for the coming Messiah. And John the Baptist certainly was about that. His entire reason for being given voice in the gospel narratives of his ministry was to announce and prepare the way for the coming of Jesus the Christ. And the way John packaged his message through very specific words and tone and images, word and tone and images of judgment, admittedly, and repentance of wrath and destruction, summarized in the idea, the image of an axe. An axe poised above the root of a tree. If the tree isn't right, doesn't produce the right fruit, it will be destroyed. An axe killing a tree. It's an interesting choice of images to prepare people for the coming of the Prince of Peace. Now it is true, there is precedent for such an image. In the Old Testament alone, book after book, full of images of death and destruction on a scale of a magnitude far greater than a single ax and a single tree. Death and destruction, in fact, of entire peoples. All in the name of God's chosen advancing the kingdom. And there's theological precedent as well. Repentance is part of the call to turn to the one true God. Judgment is the divine prerogative, a promised time when the sheep will be separated from the goats, or in John's words, the wheat from the chaff. And in the process, in the process of that happening, destruction is inevitable. The wages of sin, scripture's clear about this, is death. As interesting a choice as such images may be as groundwork for the Prince of Peace, all of them nonetheless find some resonance in Jesus' own earthly ministry. Jesus does speak of the need to repent. Indeed, it's how he begins his earthly ministry. Emerging from temptation in the wilderness to proclaim that the kingdom is, hand, is at hand and the time to repent is right now. And he speaks of judgment. He will be wielding the winnowing fork that John talks about. He will be the one separating the sheep from the goats, the wheat from the chaff. And as the book of Revelation tells us, he will be involved in the destruction preceding the second coming. And yet, at the same time, the lectionary always gives us a text about John the Baptist. It also always gives us a text like the first 10 verses of Isaiah 11. Here, a tree has been axed, but from the stump comes new life. New life that bears good fruit. Here, there are words of wisdom and understanding, peace and prosperity. And true enough, Isaiah, like John the Baptist, does speak of judgment and repentance, of wrath and destruction, but the words, the tone, the images that he uses are completely different. The Messiah will judge not with his eyes and ears, but with his heart. Will judge not sinners and the wicked, but the poor and the needy. Will judge not in service to death and destruction, but in service to compassion and justice. 
And when he does destroy, it will be destruction of evil and wickedness in order that the kingdom may be restored. The wolf will live with the lamb and the cow feed with the bear, not because those are lovely Hallmark card kinds of images, but because the kingdom is not ordered the way the world is. Because God's intent for all God's people, as we have said so many times, is that they live in peace, secure in their knowledge of the ways of the Lord. And these words, too, these words of Isaiah also find resonance in Jesus' earthly ministry. Indeed, even more so than the words of John the Baptist. Because for all of Jesus' teachings about the need for repentance, the reality of judgment and destruction, the focus of what he did and how he lived was bringing to fruition the prophecy, not of John, but of Isaiah. And given the world to which Jesus was sent, that makes sense. A world of people lost and hurting and confused, sheep without a shepherd, Jesus called them. People in need of healing and compassion and understanding. People who needed to understand what God expects of them, surely. But people who even more, even more, needed first to know how much God loves them. There's little love in John the Baptist. John was all about telling people they were sinners, that they were unworthy, that before they could expect any compassion at all, they needed to get their acts together. John was all about the kingdom not being for riffraff. And they, the people going out into the wilderness to see him, were riffraff. No wonder, perhaps, that John never had much in the way of a following, at least not compared to Jesus. This morning, I want to share a story with you that I have told you before, because I think it's a story worth hearing twice. It's an important story. It's a story of two women, Lisa and Beth, and two churches. Lisa was 29 years old, the mother of two toddlers, not a churchgoer, but feeling the need somehow to find a church for herself and her children. You know, she said, I'm still trying to figure this Jesus thing out. And that's what she wanted, was just a place to figure this Jesus thing out. One day, she found her way to a woman's Bible study at a church fairly close to where she lived. The study leader spoke a while, and then the focus shifted to conversations at each of the tables where people were sitting. I was probably the youngest one at my table, Lisa said, but we were getting along pretty well. We were talking about sex and intimacy and pregnancy because that was the focus of the study that day. I told them about a friend of mine, 19 years old, her boyfriend got her pregnant, and when he found out, abandoned her. She can't support herself, let alone the baby. And she can't go to any family members for help because she's too humiliated to let them know. And they wouldn't accept her in her pregnancy even if she did. My friend is really struggling. I told the women at my table, and she's thinking about having an abortion. Under the circumstances, I said, I could understand why my friend would be thinking that. At that point, at that moment, Lisa said, the entire conversation shifted. All the women, instead of talking with me, she said, began talking at me. Began talking at me. About how wrong it was for my friend to even be thinking about an abortion. And that I needed to rethink my own feelings about it. I didn't say another word. I just got up and left, she said. Left because what those women didn't know was that when I was about my friend's age, I had an abortion. It wasn't an experience I would wish on anyone. I knew what my friend was feeling. I also knew 
that the women at that table probably had absolutely no idea what my friend was feeling, knew nothing about her, and yet that didn't stop them from judging her or judging me. Beth was about the same age as Lisa. She had bounced from foster home to foster home her entire life. She'd been raped, she'd been beaten, she'd been abandoned, and was sleeping on the streets. And she was pregnant. One day, out of desperation, she went into a church, not because she expected them to do anything for her. Like Lisa, she had never been a churchgoer. All she really wanted was just for an hour or so to be someplace warm, to sit on something other than concrete. After she sat down in an otherwise empty pew in the back of the church, people began to approach her. And Beth became very anxious, wishing she had just stayed outside. She knew someone like her didn't really belong in a place like that, and she was afraid that they were coming to ask her to leave. But they didn't. They just said, welcome. We are so glad you're here. She went back. They welcomed her again. And even as they came to know more about her, about her situation, they continued to welcome her. One Sunday after worship, a woman in the congregation she had come to know told Beth she had something for her. Follow me, she said. And so Beth followed the woman as she led her to a part of the church she had never seen before, to a room that the women referred to as the parlor. A room, it turned out, that morning, full of people who had welcomed her over the weeks. A room full of balloons and flowers and packages, which Beth opened to find onesies and embroidered blankets and diapers and hats and booties and in one really big package, a stroller. Not once, Beth said, had they ever judged me ever said anything to me about being pregnant or unmarried or on the streets. All they ever said to me was how glad they were I was there. And what a gift it was to them to be able to help me and my baby. My sisters and brothers in Christ, in a very real sense, there are two sides to the gospel. There's the John the Baptist side, the ax poised at the root of the tree, the wrath, the reality of judgment, the need to repent, to bear good fruit or else. And then there's the Jesus side. It isn't that Jesus wasn't straight up about the very same things that John warned about, but that even more, Jesus was about grace and forgiveness, about acceptance and compassion, about love. But in comparing the earthly ministry of John the Baptist and the earthly ministry of Jesus, we don't just see two sides of the gospel. We see two sides, two ways of being church the way Lisa experienced church, and the way Beth experienced church. And the issue is not that one way of being church is to be chosen at the expense of the other. Faithfulness to the fullness of the gospel message requires elements of both ways. The issue, the issue is which way will a church emphasize? Which way will a church lead with? While Lisa and Beth came from different circumstances, were living very different lives, what they shared was a great need, before anything else, a great need for acceptance and compassion. They needed to know there were people who would accept them as they were and love them. Had they both made bad choices in life? Undoubtedly. Were there things of which both needed to repent? Absolutely. But before judgment, which is not our responsibility in any case, but God's, 
Before judgment and before repentance, they first needed compassion to be accepted, to know they were loved. The well-meaning ladies of the Bible study Lisa attended led with John the Baptist. The ax is at the root of the tree. You and your friend need to first get right with Jesus, then we can talk about love and acceptance. Health prior to admission. But the folks at the church Beth found, they led with the love and grace of Jesus. Come in. Come in. This is a place you will find compassion and acceptance. You are welcome here. We will worry about spiritual health later. Church members often have their dreams for the church. When you're a pastor especially, you hear them all the time. What they wish their church could be. And it's appropriate to have those dreams. It's appropriate to ask that question. But I think somehow it's even more appropriate to ask this question. What about Jesus' dream for the church? His church. Far too many people think of Jesus' church, as Lisa came to think of it, as a place of condemnation and judgment. And while Jesus undoubtedly would admonish us as his followers to hold fast to the reality of sin and judgment and repentance, ultimately his dream would be create a church in my image that is surely as he was the personification of grace and love so too should we, his followers, be. Our sign out front doesn't say no riffraff. It says no matter who you are, you are welcome here. Periodically, I think it's good to do a collective gut check, to ask ourselves, what do we emphasize? With what do we lead? To ask ourselves, are we a Lisa church or are we a Beth church? The first draft of this sermon ended right there, with the question, what kind of church are we? That sort of rhetorical question that pastors love to just kind of dangle out there in front of the congregation without answering, right? But after I'd finished the first draft, I was contacted by my colleague, Jacqueline Vanderpoel, who's the pastor at St. Andrew Presbyterian Church in Boulder to ask if we would be willing to co-sponsor an Afghan family being resettled in Lafayette. And I was reminded, the Lisa or Beth question isn't just a question for us as Jesus followers, as churchgoers. It's a question for us as human beings. It's a question not just about what kind of a church we are. It's a question about what kind of community we are, what kind of a nation we are, what kind of world. Are we a Beth world? Or are we a Lisa world? And let all God's people say. Amen. My friends, we've heard the word read. We've heard it proclaimed in response. If you are able, I invite you to stand. Let's join our voices in singing hymn number 378. Words are in the hymnal, also on the screen.
be seated. And now, my friends, let us worship God with our tithes and offering. together. Loving God, we give back to you now a portion of what you have given us. Gifts that you give with the intention we will receive them, that we will use them to meet our own needs. But also, Lord God, to answer your call, to use portions of them, to help meet in appropriate needs the ways of others. So we give back to you now a portion of what we've received, that you blessed it to the good of this family of faith, to our community, and to the kingdom. We pray these things in your holy name, and let all God's people say, Amen. Amen. Please be seated. As we come to our time of prayer this morning, I have several prayer cards to share with you. The first is a big thank you for the St. Vrain Manor Luncheon crew. Special thanks to Wanda Greist, Sandra Wilson, and Tom Moore. The luncheon was a great success, and thanks to the organization and the leadership of those three people. So thank you so much for your help. And I was not able to be there with you, but I have heard great response from it, and I'm sure that the people at the manor were very blessed by all of you who helped. So thank you. Rick Goldmeyer shares a joy, a prayer of thanksgiving. His daughter Amy has a new calling as a hospital chaplain in Buffalo, New York. It's great news. Um, some concerns from John Shatter. Prayers for his stepbrother, John Brooks, who fell and broke his tailbone. He's in a rehab and also suffering from dementia. Suzanne and Lawson Drinkard asks us to pray for Jim Richards. Jim is the husband of their friend, Terry Richards. He has been diagnosed with stage four lung cancer. Diane West asks us to keep Linda Lang, is it Lang, in prayer. She's having surgery on December 8th for cancer treatment. And then Wanda Grice asks us to pray for the family of Shar Jones. And I think Sandra Wilson had put this prayer request in. You had left that for me last week as well. She is the bookkeeper of St. Vrain Manor, and she passed away on Thursday from COVID. And Stephen Jan Kukic asked us to pray for the family of their friend Richard Harkness. 
Richard passed the day before his 76th birthday after a long fight with cancer. So please keep all of these folks in your prayers, the people listed, the people that have offered the prayers, and all of those that are connected. Let's go to God in prayer. Please join me. Gracious and loving God, as we move through these days of Advent toward the time we can celebrate the birth of your son, Jesus, we are reminded of the walk we take each year at this time, to look into our hearts, to maybe do a little self-check on how we are living our lives. We all have those things that we can prune away and get rid of in our habits, in our daily living, in our way of living. But we can also do a self-check to see how we are living our lives. Are we living them through love, compassion, kindness, or are we chopping away and judging? Chances are most of us are somewhere in between. So Lord God, this morning we open our hearts and we lift them to you and ask that you help us to find the path that we are meant to be on that you will help us to look at your world and see it through your eyes so that we can offer your love and your compassion and your kindness to the world. Because the world needs it. The world needs your love and your heart. And through us, we ask that you will help us to be your servants and live lives that reflect that, but live lives that offer that to others through you. We've offered many prayer requests this morning, prayers of thanksgiving and joy and thankfulness, prayers of concern for those who are facing many health issues and other struggles, and for those families who are grieving the loss of dear ones. And Lord, while we have mentioned those things, there are many others on our hearts. So we offer those to you this morning as well. Those things that we know about. But we offer, also offer our world to you, Lord God, where the wolf and the lamb should lie. We ask for peace, for shalom. We ask for our world to find that same love and compassion and kindness that you offer. We lift all these things to you, Lord God, this morning. We ask that you will be in our hearts, that you will help us to see and hear your world as you do, so that we can use our hands and feet to make a difference and share your light and your love. We ask all these things in your name, and we pray together now the prayer that you taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. My friends, this is the Lord's table. Whoever you are, wherever you come from, you are welcome here. To this table come people who have much and people who have little, people who are strong and people who are weak, people who know a lot about God and people who are just beginning to learn, people who have come to church all of their lives and people for whom this morning may be the very first time, people who know that they're blessed and others who frankly aren't quite sure. Because this is not our table, this is the Lord's table. And the same Jesus Christ who died and rose for all people welcomes all people to come and see and taste that God is good. Communion is a reminder of what God has done for us through the life, death, and resurrection of his son. The God who created us is the God who forgives us and takes care of us. The God who calls us to wholeness and everlasting life with Jesus Christ. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, here and now, as we share this bread and this cup, 
We celebrate the love that binds us one to another as brothers and sisters in the family of Christ. And so it is that all who trust Jesus, whether a little or a lot, but wish to trust him more, are invited to come and to be part of this feast that he has prepared. On the night that he was arrested, our Lord ate a final meal with his disciples and in the simple act of breaking bread and sharing the cup, explained to them and to you and to me the very purpose of his work on earth. Taking the bread, he blessed and broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body broken for you. As often as you eat of it, do so in remembrance of me. And in a similar manner, after supper, Jesus took the cup and pouring wine into the cup said, this is the new covenant in my blood poured out for the salvation of all creation. As often as you drink of it, do so in remembrance of me. And so it is, my brothers and sisters in Christ, as often as we eat of this bread and drink of this cup, we do profess our conviction that Jesus Christ was born, he lived, he died, he rose. But best of all, he's going to come again. And when he does, we will all sit at table together in the kingdom of heaven. My friends, as has been our custom since we return to in-person worship, we're going to do communion by inviting you to come forward as you are directed by uh, the ushers to one of two stations here at the front or if you're in the overflow room to the station there to take one of the gluten-free crackers out of a cup and then to take a cup of the juice. Then you can place both of the empty cups into a plastic tray that the server will be holding. I think this act of the household of faith is open to all, as I said a moment ago, who trust in Jesus Christ whether a little or a lot, and who wish to trust him more. And this, of course, includes all children. If it's easier for you to remain seated, please feel free to do that, and we will bring the cracker and the juice to you. And then at the end, after all of you have been served, I will serve the servers here at the front of the sanctuary. My friends, these are the gifts of God for the people of God.
My friends, we have one more hymn left that we're going to sing together. I invite you to stand if you're able. Just join our voices in singing. Words will be on the screen.
My friends, a reminder to you about the alternative Christmas market through the doors there in Fellowship Hall. We invite you to go in there after worship and peruse. There are undoubtedly people on your Christmas list you need to buy for. Um, one of them has initials DB, not that you need to be reminded of that, but nonetheless, here's an opportunity. As always, there also will be a deacon here at the front of the sanctuary, uh, the close of the service. He or she will have a blue ribbon on so you can identify them. Anything at all that you'd like prayer for or with you, we invite you to come forward, meet with them, and they will be happy to pray for or with you. And now, my friends, let us join our voices in saying together the words of our charge and blessing. Lord, make us instruments of your peace. Where there is hatred, help us to show love. Where there is injury, help us to be agents of healing. Where there is doubt, help us to live faith. Where there is despair, help us to give hope. Where there is darkness, help us to be light. Where there is sadness, help us to share joy. Lord, grant that we may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. And may the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each and every one of you this day and all days to come. And let all God's people say, Amen. Amen.